Amen. Well, good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. That was fun having the all-male choir and uh, enjoyed that very much. All right, if you have your Bibles, we are going to be in the book of 1 Timothy. We'll be in chapter 1 and chapter 2 today as we uh, continue our study through the letters of Paul to Timothy. Our subject today is prayer. Prayer is our communication with the king of the universe. I mean, it is our right, our birthright as Christians that we have a direct line of communication with our Father in heaven. And we have the privilege, excuse me, I was singing too loud. It's got me. Hopefully we can get it together. We have the privilege of letting all of our requests be made known to God. We confess our sins. We offer our requests, whatever they may be. We admit our failures. We admit our fears. We confess our faith. You know, through fear or through, through prayer, we literally overcome by faith all of our fears. That's the privilege we have. And in our passage today, Paul uses the the imagery of war for why we pray. We are waging a spiritual war against a very real spiritual enemy. Our enemy is spiritual. Satan and demons, these are spiritual beings that have the ability to travel between dimensions. Now, we do not usually see them. Sometimes we can, sometimes they do appear. Usually not how we think. Oftentimes if they do appear, if they do interact with us in the flesh, which they do every day, but it's in a way that is friendly, deceitful. That's how they work. But they are our enemy. And it's a battle, it's a war, and the stakes are the souls of mankind. It's a spiritual battle. And because you're a Christian, because we are in Christ, that puts us on the front line of this war. We're the ones who are being attacked. You see, the the demons know that if they can keep God's army and God's people and Christians silent, if they can keep us on the sidelines, cowering in fear or afraid or embarrassed to share our faith, they know that we're not going to win souls of people. So they do everything they can to use any means that they can to trap us into sin and to keep us from sharing our faith. Christian, this is our reality. This is who you are in Christ. You're God's people, and truly, we're just a remnant today. You know, we can look around our society. We know the state of things. The church is declining. Talking about overall. Truly are, we are are a remnant today. But this is who you are in Christ. You are part of God's army. And our calling, our purpose is to win the world to Christ, win lost people. Therefore, we must go out into the world, but we must not be like the world. You know, the truth is, if the only place that you express your faith is whenever you're inside these walls on Sunday morning, if this is the only place you express your faith, or if the only other place you express your faith is in the privacy of your own home, There's no way that we can win the world to Christ. It has to be out there. We have to go wage war against the kingdom of darkness and win people for the kingdom of Christ. You know, Thomas Paine, during the Revolutionary War, he was frustrated at one point because the American army had been holed up inside of a, a city and they were not going out to fight. And he was frustrated and he wrote this and said this, an army in a city can never be a conquering army. You know, and he's right, and this is true of the church as well. If we are the army of God, we will never be a conquering army if we just stayed holed up in our church buildings or in our homes and keeping our faith completely private 100% of the time. No, we're supposed to go forward and conquer. And we have to fight well. Verse 18 of chapter 1, look at it. Paul says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, 
having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may, not, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul tells us in this passage that we need to fight well. He says, he says, Timothy, you need to go and wage good warfare. Therefore, there is a warfare that we are to wage, and we need to learn to fight well in this war. Paul says in verse 18, this charge I commit to you. He says, according to the prophecies made concerning you, you wage the good warfare. Now, the prophecies that Paul refers to here no doubt refers to the Word of God, the Word that led to the salvation of Timothy. And it also could refer to Paul being who Paul was. He could have prophesied over Timothy after Timothy came to faith in Christ and prophesied on what he was going to do being a pastor in the city of Ephesus. He says, according to these prophecies, wage the good warfare. Timothy was discipled by Paul. He was taught God's word. Paul says, by these that you may wage the good warfare. So if we are to wage warfare, that means we are supposed to go on the offense. We're to take the fight to the enemy. And think about what that means for us. It means we are to take the gospel to lost people, unbelievers in this world. And we're to live on mission. It's a calling that we respond to. You know, this is, this is why we live differently than those in the world. That we, we don't live as they live. We don't party like the world parties. We're not supposed to. We don't live in the same sins that they, that they live in. Because we are sent by Christ to go and win them. That's who you are. Maybe you haven't embraced it, but this is who you're supposed to be as a Christian. You're to go out into the world and win them, not go act like them. We're sent by Christ to show them another way. And if we can't do it, then we're not being on the offense. So we have to be active. We have to be purposely sharing our faith, seeking to win the loss. Now, Appian, the Roman historian, he discussed the, the battle strategies and compared them between Pompey and Julius Caesar. Pompey believed that whenever his flank was under attack by an enemy, that his army should not advance, that they should not break their line of formation, but they should take a defensive posture. But Julius Caesar, he criticized this and he, he wrote about it in his letters. And he said this, that the blows are delivered with more force and the spirits of the men are raised by running while those who stand still lose courage by reason of their immobility and become excellent targets for those charging against them. Now I read that, I said, you know what? Paul agrees with Julius Caesar in his battle strategy. Our courage is gonna be raised if we're running, if we're going on the offense, not if we're immobile and passive and on the defense. If we're holding back, if we're hiding our faith, our immobility will just make us easy targets for our enemy. We're supposed to be on the offense. We're supposed to wage the good warfare. So Paul uses the imagery of a conquering army to describe the church. Verse 19, he says, go forward, fight well with faith and a good conscience. You see, without faith, without a good conscience, we're gonna be like these two guys that Paul mentions in this passage, Hymenaeus and, and Alexander, whose faith was shipwrecked. You see, our faith is in Christ. It is in the word of God. And our faith in Christ and his word, it is like a shield to us. And we are supposed to take the shield of faith by which Ephesians chapter six says that we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one, our enemy. Because they're gonna be lobbed at us. We are the subject of the attack. We are the ones that the wicked ones are gonna come against because they want to shut us down. We have to have our shields of faith protects us. You see, this is how it works. See, when we're tempted to sin, tempted to compromise and live like the world, that's when we use our shield of faith. When temptation to sin comes, we choose by faith to trust in God's word. When we're tempted in any way, there's a million ways in which we are tempted. We're tempted to compromise, but we're tempted to open sin. We choose by faith to trust God's word, not how we feel, not what our friends are telling us, not what the world is saying. If you're finding truth out in the world, you're gonna be deceived 100%. No, our faith is built on God's word and nothing else. 
And we take up the shield of faith and we just choose to follow God's word. And our faith will keep our conscience clear. Hebrews 9.14 says that our conscience is sprinkled by the blood of Christ. The writer of Hebrews says, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. If you continue in sin, knowing that, knowing that the blood of Christ was shed for you, if you continue in sin, your conscience will be guilty. You'll carry that burden of guilt. And if you persist in that sin and rebellion against the Lord, ultimately it's going to shipwreck your faith. Just like these two guys. And that's where a lot of Christians are, I'm afraid. They're shipwrecked. They've crashed up on the shore into a thousand pieces. That's what their life looks like. As though they, the winds just drove them against the shore, against the rocks. And they're broken up. Because their conscience is guilty. And here's Paul's point. You're not going to be able to wage the good warfare if you have a shipwrecked faith. And just to be very specific about it, I know we don't like specifics, but you're deceiving yourself. If you think that you can live in sin, that you can go out partying like the world, that you can sleep with your boyfriend, sleep with your girlfriend, you're deceiving yourself. If you think that you can do these things without consequence, you're just deceiving yourself. It doesn't work that way. Your conscience will condemn you. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're not going to lose your salvation. But the Holy Spirit of God who lives within you is going to convict you. God is our Father. He punishes us. He doesn't kick us out of his family. That's why I just told Ren up there before I baptized him. God will never kick you out of his family. Our Father will punish us if we live in rebellion. But no, the blood of Christ takes away our sins. But Paul's point is not that you're going to lose your salvation. It's you're supposed to be taking the fight to the enemy. You're supposed to be living differently than the world. Don't shipwreck your faith. We wage the good warfare through faith and a good conscience. And we need to fight well. All right, how do we fight well? Well, we need to fight with prayer. All right, look at verse 1. Chapter 2. Paul says, therefore, referring to the previous verses, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. We need to learn to fight with prayer. You know, Winston Churchill wrote his memoirs after World War II. And he quoted the rule of Admiral Lord Fisher, the rule of conduct. And it went like this. He said, moderation in war is folly. If you strike, strike hard and strike wherever you can. And I believe that's exactly how we need to live our faith. That's how we need to approach life. We are in a spiritual battle. It is, this is not a time for moderation especially in the age in which we live. And I do believe that the time in which we live is different than all others. I believe we live in the most unique time in human history. The time for moderation is not now. No, we need to strike. We need to strike hard and wherever we can. And we are in a fight and we need to fight with prayer. We need to be covered in prayer. We need to be a people of prayer. What did Jesus say? You have not because you ask not. Do not attempt to live your faith without praying and seeking the Lord. Paul had told Timothy to wage the good warfare. Now he tells him how to do it. He says in verse 1, Therefore, first of all, I exhort that you pray for all men. And by men, in these passages, it's referring to mankind. It's all of us. And he spells out all the different postures of prayer. Pray for all with supplications and prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. These are all synonyms for prayer. 
Supplications means that we take our requests before God. Prayers and intercessions means that we pray on behalf of others. And what stands out to me in this passage, if you look at it closely, is that it's directed towards others. Now, we're really, we're really good about praying for ourselves and praying for our immediate family. You know, for, for many of us, that's the, the entire subject of our prayers is my own self and my own family. But if we're waging the good warfare, we're not going to be so selfish to think of only ourselves when we pray. Now, this is one way that we can know if we're truly on the offense in the spiritual battle or if we're being immobile and just hiding our faith. If you're stuck in your prayer life and the substance of your prayer life is mainly, God, just forgive me of my sins. And that's where many of us get because we have so many sins. We don't feel worthy to do anything. We feel unworthy to tell others about Jesus because we know we have sin. And so the essence of our prayer life is, God, just forgive me. I'm low down. I'm no good. It's great you confess your sins. You should do that. But just, we're supposed to pray for others. This is how you take the fight to the enemy. When you pray for others who are in the world who need to be saved and delivered from sin. <clears throat> there's somebody at your school, there's somebody at your place of business, in your neighborhood, whatever it is, wherever God has put you that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. Pray for them. That's how you take the fight to the enemy. You pray for them and seek opportunity to share your faith. Paul says pray for all men, especially for kings and those in positions of power. You notice he, he didn't specify that we only pray for leaders that we like or who are good leaders. You know, who was the king at this time? It was a guy named Nero. He was the Roman emperor whenever Paul wrote this passage. He was a wicked man. This is the king who persecuted Christians. You know, Tacitus, the, the Roman historian, was alive at this time. He wrote his history at this time, and you can read his book. And he has an amazing passage where he talks about how Nero... He was suspected to have burned down half the city of Rome. Half the city of Rome burned down. Many people suspected that Nero had ordered it to be done because he had an ambitious building project for that part of the city that he wanted to complete. And Tacitus wrote this. He said, to suppress this rumor, Nero fabricated scapegoats and punished with every refinement the notoriously depraved Christians, as they were popularly called. Their originator, Christ, this is written by a Roman historian in the first century. Their originator, Christ, had been executed in Tiberius' reign by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Their deaths were made uh, farcical, dressed in wild animal skins. They were torn to pieces by dogs, crucified, or made into torches to be ignited after dark as substitutes for daylight. Nero provided his gardens for the spectacle and exhibited displays in the circus. Despite their guilt as Christians and the ruthless punishment it deserved, the victims were pitied, for it was felt that they were being sacrificed for one man's brutality rather than to the national interest. <laughs> this is who we're to pray for? When Paul wrote this to Timothy, he could have said, this is who we're to pray for, for Nero? Look at verse two, pray for kings. And those in authority, and why do we pray for them? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And he adds in verse 3 that this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior. Our God and Savior expects us to live humble, peaceable lives. And to pray for our leaders. Because verse 4 says that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Because there's only one God and there's one mediator between God and man. The mediator is Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, we as the church, we as the army of God, we are the ambassadors of heaven. Bringing this truth to the world so that mankind might be saved. Even the wicked rulers of this age. We're to pray for them that we might have peace and freedom. So we might share the gospel and win them to Christ's kingdom. And it doesn't matter who is in power. It can be tyrants or kings or presidents. It doesn't matter who's ruling for us. Whether it's Democrats or Republicans. Ultimately it doesn't matter who is in power. 
for us because our allegiance is ultimately to Christ and his kingdom. We're fighting a different battle. Our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's spiritual. Our banner under which we fight is Jesus Christ. And God desires all men to be saved, not some, but all. And Paul says in verse 7, I've been appointed a preacher and I'm speaking the truth in Christ. You see, this is our same calling. We are appointed to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul's exhorting us to do. This is what I'm exhorting y'all to do. Jefferson Baptist Church, if you're a member of this church, this is what I'm exhorting you to do. It's the exact same thing, to go out and wage the good warfare. Have faith. Have a good conscience. Do not allow anything into your life that will cause your faith to be shipwrecked and make it where you can't tell others about Jesus. What I'm asking you to do is to go on the offense. Stop hiding your faith. Stop only practicing your faith on Sunday mornings and in your homes, but actually take it out into the world. And what does that look like? I'm not saying you should go be a street preacher. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying go build relationships with the people that God has put in front of you. And ultimately lead it to sharing your faith. Lead that conversation. Build that trust. Build that relationship. Be a genuine friend. And lead them to Christ. This is what God's calling us to do. Go and engage the enemy by building relationships with people in this world who are not Christians. But go in prayer. Pray for all men. Intercede for our rulers. Pray for our president. Don't get caught up in all the foolishness of the world, especially in this election season and the noise on social media. Do not go there. You are a Christian. You are an ambassador of heaven. We're appointed to share the gospel. And the gospel, again, is that there is one mediator between God and man. There is one Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for all. And because he died for all, he desires all to be saved. That's why we're to pray for all. How do we pray? All right, verse eight, last verse. <clears throat> I desire, therefore, <clears throat> that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So in this verse, Paul teaches us how to pray, the attitude of prayer, what it looks like. First of all, he says this. I got three points from this passage. We're gonna go through these three quickly. Number one is this, pray everywhere. Pray everywhere. And how is that to be done? How do we pray everywhere? You know, when you think about it, this command is, is amazing. If we're going to pray everywhere, that means that God is everywhere. Sometimes when you think you're alone and nobody sees, you need to remember this. You can pray everywhere because God is everywhere. He sees. He knows. And if we're instructed to pray everywhere we go, that means that we should keep away from those places where we are ashamed to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, the only places that we're not gonna be willing to pray, and I'm talking about silent prayers in our hearts even, are places where we don't really like the idea of God knowing that we are there, or that we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing. So inherent within this command is that we guard ourselves from these situations and behaviors that keep us from being able to pray. You know, you can pray at work anytime, but you're not gonna be able to pray at work if your work is immoral or if you're doing something wrong or taking advantage of others. You can pray when you're out with your friends, but you're not gonna be able to pray with your friends, even in your heart. If you and your friends are doing something that is immoral, you're not gonna be able to pray. You can pray in your home, but if your relationship with your spouse is troubled and it's unhealthy and you're unhappy in the home, you're not gonna be able to pray. In fact, to the men on this Father's Day, I'd remind you that 1 Peter chapter 3, Paul essentially, or Peter essentially says, man, don't even bother praying if you're not taking care of your wives, if you don't understand your wives. He says, your prayers will be hindered if you're not taking care of your wife. Now, this command for us to pray everywhere, it's a very sharp test for us whether or not we are in the circumstances that we should be in. Don't let us go anywhere where we cannot take God with us. And if we feel like it would be something like blasphemy if we called on his name in that place wherever we are, we got to get ourselves out of there. So Paul says, I desire, number one, to, for all men to pray everywhere. Number two, pray with holy hands. 
Now, if a person stands with her open, empty palms up to God, it's a sign. Whenever we hold up our hands to the Lord, it's a sign we're saying to the Lord, God, I need something from you. I'm bringing, I have nothing. I'm bringing, I need you to answer my prayer. I need, I desire, I expect it. Now, these are elements that we need to have in our prayer life. The sense of want, the longing for an answer. You know, what, what, when is it that you hold out your hands? It's when you want something. If you're holding out your hands to me, it's because you want me to drop something into those hands. We hold up our hands to the Lord because we want God to answer our prayer, especially when we're praying an offensive spiritual battle kind of prayer where we're not just praying selfish things for ourselves. Nothing wrong, you can pray anything to God. But we also need to be on the offense. We need to be praying for the lost, praying for others around us. But the hands that we hold up in prayer, Paul says they need to be holy hands. In other words, if you're holding on to something in this world, you're not gonna be able to lift up holy hands to the Lord. We lift up our hands to the Lord, but they need to be open. The palms need to be empty. You know, if we hold up our, our hands to the Lord and we, our fists are clenched because we're holding on to something, that's no way to pray. That's not holding up holy hands. If there's some sin that we're holding on to and we can't open it up to the Lord, no, that means we're holding on to something in this world. We're not, we're not able to hold up holy hands. We got to leg it. With, that means we have to confess our sins to the Lord. That's how you hold up holy hands. There's none of us that are holy. The only reason that we are holy is because of Christ's righteousness inside of us, the blood of Christ. There's none of us worthy. But you can hold up holy hands to the Lord by confessing your sins, by giving it to Christ, not trying to hide your faith. So whenever we pray, we must confess our sin. Let me just remind you, do not deceive yourselves. We must not deceive ourselves. We tell ourselves, I hear this so often, and this is kind of the attitude of modern Christianity. Well, I'm a sinner. I mean, I'm not better than anybody else. And what they really are saying, that's how they're justifying living in sin. Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be self-righteous. I'm just as sinful as anybody. And what they're saying is, I've given up. I'm just going to keep living in sin. Now we're supposed to repent. We're supposed to change. We're supposed to be free from it. Lift up holy hands to the Lord. Don't deceive yourself. He says, lift up holy hands. He says, I desire men to pray everywhere. Number two, lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So number three, and this is the final point, pray in faith. Pray in faith. To pray in faith means that we pray without holding on to anger and doubts in our hearts. We are not to pray angry prayers. We're not supposed to be angry people. We don't pray, God, make them pay for how they treated me. God, smite them. You know, we might not be so bold to pray that particular prayer, but it's what, what we think in our heart. Somebody wrongs us, somebody hurts us, or we don't like, we, we want retribution. That's not how Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray. He said, he said God, Forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. That's how we're to pray. We're to pray. You know, the, the Bible says if, if we're in prayer and we remember in our hearts, somebody has something against us. He says, stop praying. Go make it right with your brother, with your sister, and then come back and pray. Now, we're not to hold on to anger. Paul says we're to pray without wrath, without doubting. If we have anger or if we have doubt in our hearts, it makes it where we cannot pray as we should. And remember, this is a spiritual war. Paul's instructions on how we are to pray is in the context of how we can wage a good warfare. To wage a good warfare means that you're taking it to the enemy. You're engaging. In order to fight, we need to pray. In order to pray, we need to be in the faith. Anger and doubt are not part of our faith. That's the flesh. And we're to give those things up and we are to walk in faith. The question is, will you answer the call of God? This is God's call on all of us. You're saved. You're born again. Live differently than the world. Will you answer the call of God? We need you. The church needs all of us. 
in this hour in which we are living, time is short. We need to live with a genuine faith. God's put you right where you are. He's opened those doors. He's given you the friends that you have in your life. He's surrounded you with these people so that you will be the light for Christ to them, so that you will battle on their behalf if they're unbelievers. Will you engage in the spiritual battle? Join me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, your word is our life. It's our light. It's our rock. We build our lives upon your word. We thank you for it. Holy Spirit, now take your word. God, speak into every heart, mind, and soul in this place. May you bless Jefferson Baptist Church. May we be a people who share our faith, who are engaged in the battle. And God, I pray for every soul in this place, Lord God, for those that need to commit their life to you. God, today, may they answer that call. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.